25. Um, once again, rarely does the Lord direct me, I guess, in my years of ministry. He directed me to, uh, to the place where um, I talked about end time events and whatnot, which I'm not going to really talk about end time. I'm just going to share some things of what's, what's coming. But uh, let's begin reading in verse 36. No one knows about the day or hour, not even angels in heaven nor the Son, but only the Father. As it is written, as it was in the days of Noah, so it be in the coming of the Son of Man. For in the days before the flood, people were eating and drinking and marrying and giving in marriage up to the day Noah entered the ark. And they knew nothing about what would happen until the flood came and took them away, and took them all away. This is how it will be in the coming of the Son of Man. Two men will be in a field, one will be taken, the other left. Two women will be grinding with a hand mill. One will be taken and the other left. Therefore, keep watch because you do not know at what day your Lord will come. But understand this, if the owner of the house had known at what time of night the thief was coming, he would have kept watch and would not let his house be broken into. So you also must be ready because the Son of Man will come at an hour when you do not expect him. Who then is faithful and wise servant whom the master has put in charge of his servant? in his household to give them their food at the proper time. It will be good for that servant whose master finds him doing. Catch that? Doing. So when he returns. I tell you the truth, he will put him in charge of all his possessions. But suppose that servant is wicked and says to himself, my master is staying away a long time. And he then begins to beat his fellow servants and to eat and drink with drunkards. The master of that servant will come on that on a day when he does not expect him in an hour when he's not aware of it. He will cut him into pieces and assign him a place with the hypocrites where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. At that time the kingdom of heaven will be like ten virgins who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish and five were wise. The five foolish ones took their lamps but did not take any oil with them. The wise, however, took oil in their jars along with their lamps. And the bridegroom was a long time in coming. And they all became drowsy and fell asleep. At midnight, the cry rang out. Here's the bridegroom. Come out to meet him. Then all the virgins woke up and trimmed their lamps. The foolish ones said to the wise, Give us some of your oil. Our lamps are going out. No, they replied, they are, there may not be enough for both us and you. Instead, go to the place, go to those who sell oil and buy some for yourselves. But while they were on their way to buy the oil, the bridegroom arrived. The virgins who were ready went in with him to the wedding banquet, and the door was shut. Later the others also came. Sir, sir, they said, open the door for us. But he replied, I tell you the truth, I don't know you. Therefore keep watch, because you do not know the day or the hour. Father, this morning we thank you for your word. We thank you, Lord God, for what it says. Thank you, Lord God, that we don't have to read into it. We can just take what you've written and continue to watch you unveil, reveal, and make it known to us the things that we need to know and understand today. Father, I pray that you'll continue to find a, a faithful servants all across the world. Servants that have been tending to, the, to their own lives where they know they're full of oil for that day when you come. And so, Lord, we just thank you and praise you for what you're going to be able to say today. I surrender myself, Lord, that I would not speak of my flesh, but I would speak that which is of the Spirit. Amen. And so, Lord, guard my mouth today, that what I say would be of the leading of the Holy Spirit. So we love you and praise you. In the mighty name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. One of the only scriptures, I think I might have shared just a tidbit of this, but one of the only scriptures that we find in the Bible that talk about not sharing is written in the Ten Virgin story. I thought Christians were supposed to share. We are. We are told that we are to share. But when it comes to the coming of the Lord and the, or the bridegroom, 
God is the bride's groom, and we are the bride, whether we're male or female, we're the bride, and we are to be preparing ourselves for his return, because nobody knows the day nor the hour when he will come. If anybody ever predicts a day or a time and says, this is when he's coming, that's your first clue they're a false prophet. Or they're not telling you the truth. Because we just read here today, nobody, not even the angels, and not even the Son, only the Father, knows when he's coming back. So we, we can deduct from that that there's, there's this work that God is uh, preparing his people for. And uh, what I found interesting is, is that through this whole story, I'm not going to be able to live off your oil, and you're not going to be able to live off mine. We all need to get our own. And if we don't have enough, there's nobody to blame but yourself. And if you're not prepared when he comes, there's nobody to blame but yourself. You're not going to be able to blame preachers. You're not going to be able to blame, be able to blame your parents your grandparents, no matter who, because every single one of us is to get our own oil. And we're going to read some scriptures that surround that and uh, try to talk about how to, to be full of the Spirit, how to be, to be ready when that time comes. How many have ever gotten tired waiting for Jesus to come? Just be honest. Yeah, there's a few of you. You get tired. It's like, Lord, when are you coming back? Well, that's fine and dandy, but the reality is, is that the Bible says he's going to come like a thief in the night. You know, he's going to be a thief in the night to those that aren't prepared, but to those that are prepared, he's not going to be a thief in the night. So like, I've been waiting for you. It's here. Woo it's going to be a great glorious day when Jesus comes. Now, we may not be here, but you still have to remain faithful. You still have to have oil in your lamps because the only way these lamps, if we go back to the time of the lamps that they used, they had to trim their wicks and make sure their wicks didn't build up so that they would go out. So there was this constant maintenance of, of their wicks, of their light being lit inside of them. And how many of you know, every day is a maintenance day for a Christian. There isn't one day we get off. Every day is a, is a maintenance day because I have to trim Jeff Capel so it doesn't go out. I have to get rid of more of me so my flame doesn't go out. And so the reality is, is that even though they were trimming their wicks so they could have light when the, when the bridegroom came, they were waiting for this great, wonderful opportunity. The reality is, is that we don't all walk around with candlesticks today. We walk around with ourselves who lives inside of us, Jesus Christ. He's the light of the world. So when we walk around, if we don't keep us trim, he's not going to shine. He's not going to be well lit. People aren't going to see who he is. And I don't know about you, but like I say, every day is a maintenance day. Every day is a day for each and every one of us to trim our lamps of our own life so that when Jesus does come, we are ready and prepared. I find it interesting that it says in, in verse 1 of chapter 25, it says, At the time the kingdom of heaven will be like ten virgins who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. They were anticipating. They were waiting. They were in an anticipation of what was taking place. And five of them were foolish and five were wise. In other words, if we were to statistically look at the Bible, over half of the people aren't going to go to heaven. If you, I mean, if you think about it, two will be walking in the field, one will be taken, one will be left. Five virgins made it, five virgins did. Now that's not factual. I'm just throwing it out as an observation. Look at, look at <laughs> the lepers. How many of them even came back and gave thanks? <laughs> Only one. Wow. God needs more credit than that, doesn't he? we got to remember that we don't ever get into that point where we don't come back and give God credit for what he rightfully needs and rightfully wants. And that is to be honored and praised all the days of our life. So he says, five of them were foolish and five were wise. And the foolish ones took their lamps but did not take any oil with them. 
But the wise ones, however, took oil in jars along with their lamps. So there was some preparations made. And where do you think that came from? I believe that came from the Holy Spirit. Because the Holy Spirit never runs out of what he needs, no matter who he inhabits. So once he inhabits me, he's going to instruct me to do different things along my walk with him. And if I'm a wise virgin, I will begin to do what he asks. As I told you a little earlier during the worship, the Lord has told me to shut my radio off and just to pray in the Spirit as I drive down the road. I, I normally can pray in the Spirit listening to something. But this time he told me to shut it up. I could say, well, Lord, you know, really? I, I mean, I could pray without doing that. But out of obedience and my desire to be obedient to him, I shut it off. And I get, I get to where I'm going really fast. I... I I should actually time it sometimes. I, I don't say I'm being translated. I'm just saying, it's amazing how quick you get there. And so when God begins to instruct us to do things, who, who do I belong to anyway? Do I belong to Jeff Cabell or do I belong to God? And if I belong to God, if he's in charge, shouldn't I listen to him? Of course I should. Even in the smallest details of life. There'll be times in the middle of the night when the Lord will wake me up, and I know I'm not normally up that time, so it's like, okay, do you want me to pray? And here's what I go through. Can I lay in bed and pray, or do I have to get up? Because how many have ever prayed in bed? Of course you can pray in bed. But I want to be obedient to the many of the details, because there might be things I will miss if I don't walk in obedience. And so it's really important, I think, to come to the place where you just give God what He wants, what He's asking for, and do what He's wanting you to do. Yes, He can tell you what He wants you to do, but I'm one of those guys that likes to ask a lot of questions. When we're worshiping, I just say, how long do you want us to do this? I could go off what I think and what I feel, but how many know the have been wrong a few times? <laughs> But when, when we're being led by the Spirit, we're watching God do what He does, it's easy because all the pressure's off us. All we are is a caretaker of what He's given us. And I'll be honest with you, if you don't take care of what God's given you, it might be taken away. Well, look at the seven churches in Revelation. What did He tell them? Either do this, or I will come and take your candle from you. There's a consequence to not listening to God's voice. And I don't know what kind of consequence God brings, but I do know that He warns them. If God gives us a warning, I think we should heed it. So we need to continue to listen to what God's saying, hear what God is saying, and let it be a joy to your heart that you're hearing what God says. How many like to hear God's voice? Come on. Woo-hoo. Right. Because you know He ain't going to lead you down the wrong path. He's not going to lead you astray. He's going to want you want to come to the place where you learn to surrender. So I'll be honest with you. In my days of growing older as I am, I've learned to shorten my time of arguing with God. Yeah, we lose anyway. Exactly. And I don't argue very much because I grew up underneath my dad when, you know, just knowing my dad, some of you remember him. It's just way easier to do it the first time. Yeah, right, exactly. So why not make life easy? Just do it right, do it the way he wants it the first time, and then things go better. But you got to remember that was my dad, and uh, I, I think it, I think my dad was training for me to learn how to respond to God. God isn't a dictator, but he, he's a wonderful leader. He's not going to come down and make me like my dad would. <laughs> But the reality is, is that the quicker I learn to surrender, the easier it is to hear what God's saying, even in the windstorm. Even when you, when you can't hear his voice, it's like, well, if I know my dad, he would want me to go this way and do this way. Why? Because I've learned the tendencies of knowing what he's saying. I've learned the, the characteristics of who he is and what he's about. And my prayer for myself is this. That I learn to respond to the work of his hand as quickly as I can so that I can once again enjoy the benefits of what he wants to give me. And 
And how many of you know peace is a benefit? Rest is a benefit. Joy is a benefit. And we can go right up down the list. But all the benefits that God promises is, is going to come your way when you continue to learn to surrender. Now, I don't know about you. I'm thankful more than I could ever imagine for his mercy. What a benefit of the kingdom. How many need mercy today? Yeah, we do. And I'm thankful for that. Because God doesn't give me what I deserve. But he's so good to me to be able to extend to us things that he wants us to have. Why? Because he wants you to overcome. He wants you to be like his son and not be affected by everything that's going around him. But to continue to walk through life and overcome. He wants you to overcome. He wants you to be a success story like his son. That no matter what came against them, he overcame. And I love that one thing that people like to pray all the time, but it's, re it's a reality. It's like, I literally have to say, Lord, not my will, but your will be. Because at that hour, Jesus was like, if this is really where you want me to go, I'll go. But if there's any other way, I'll be glad to take it. Let me ever ask God, it's like, are you sure this is the only way I can get patience? Isn't there an easier way I can get some peace? <laughs> I mean, we go to him and we try to get these things, and God just loves to, to pour out. But it's, you know, one of the ways that God continues to guide and direct. And so the bridegroom was coming, and they were waiting for him. And as they, the bridegroom was coming, in verse 5 it says, the bridegroom was a long time in coming, and they all became drowsy and fell asleep. Man, has that ever happened to you in your spiritual walk? You get, you get going in your spiritual walk, and it's like, man, I, I, remember, I remember the awakening. You guys remember the awakening? We went, I don't know how many nights in a row, night after night, just, just energized by what God was doing. It's like, man, I could never lose track of this. Oh, yes, we did. Yeah. I mean, because you get tired. You get weary. You get physically, you just, something happens. And then when you get physically tired, you get spiritually tired sometimes, <coughs> don't you? Let's just be honest with ourselves and quit faking it. You know, fake it till you make it. <laughs> but you know what? That's where his strength is sufficient. That's where his rest, his power is sufficient. And so we have to rely on him when things like that happen. And even in everyday life, we get tired. And God will come along and he'll, he'll empower you. He'll give you what, you what you couldn't have by yourself. So that even when they got tired, they were waiting for this, this bridegroom to come. But they got tired and they fell asleep. But I want you to, I want to warn you. Even like from God's word it says, at midnight. You know what I found interesting, and I don't know if there's any biblical basis to this. Midnight is where the next day begins, right? So I'm not saying God's going to come at midnight, but I'm going to say when the days of our lives here on earth are done, the new day will begin. And Jesus will come back. I don't know what day that will be, and I'm not saying it's going to be midnight. All I know is that when his day and his calendar is all fulfilled, there's going to be a new heaven and a new earth. He's going to come back, come and get us. We're going to rise and meet him in the air, and we'll be going to take it away with him. But those that aren't prepared for him aren't going to go. If you don't have enough oil in your life, you're not going to go. According to what we read. So he says, at midnight, verse 6, the cry rang out, and the bridegroom come out to meet him. Then all the virgins awoke and trimmed their lamps. The foolish one said to the wise, give us some of your oil. Our lamps are going out. No, they replied, I'm not going to be a Christian today and share. <laughs> That's really what they were saying. No, they, what they were saying is, 
I prepared. I brought enough oil for myself. I'm waiting for the, even though we're all in a group today, I'm waiting for the bridegroom to come. And I made sure, I took the time to make sure. I took time to spend time with God. I took time to be filled with the Spirit. I took time to read His Word. I took time to hear God's voice. I took time to rearrange my life so it looks more like Him. Even though they were all virgins, even though they all had lamps, even though they were all on the same ship, find it interesting that only five of them went the extra mile. Only five had enough oil for when Jesus came. Now, I don't believe that has to be a statistic in the church. I don't believe that has to be uh, like that story. There is absolutely no reason why 50% of us here today wouldn't go and meet the bridegroom if we came today. Because all of us have opportunity to allow the Holy Spirit to give us enough oil that we're going to be ready when he comes. But in the midst of waiting, we got to be careful that we don't get tired. We don't try to fill it up with something else, even though we're all part of the bridegroom. I find that very interesting. So they went off to buy some of their own. But verse 10, while they were on their way to buy the oil, the bridegroom arrived. And the virgins who were ready went in with him to the wedding banquet, and the door was shut. A lot of people don't like that verse simply because there's an ending to what God said. But it's true. There's no reason why we shouldn't be prepared. Later the others came. Sir, sir, they said, open the door for us. But when he replied, I tell you the truth. I don't know you. I don't know about you, but that seems pretty strong. That he said to them, I don't know you. Why didn't they know you? Know him? They didn't have any oil. So he says, they were on their way to buy oil. They, the bridegroom came, verse 11, and, he, and verse 12, he says, I tell you the truth, I don't know you. Therefore, keep watch because you do not know the day or the hour when he will come. Interestingly enough, if what a horrible day in the natural. Huh. If you think about a wedding where the, the bride has been waiting for the groom to come, and when the groom shows up, the bride isn't even aware of her own for the wedding day. He shows up and it's like, where is she? Oh, she went off to buy some more things. What? On my wedding day? In the natural, that would be hard to take, wouldn't it? Standing at the altar waiting for your bride to show up. You knew I was coming. I told you I was coming. I've, I've been faithful to every promise I've ever given. I, I told you I was coming. Has God ever been unfaithful? Of course not. So here's the reality for all of us as believers. We know he's coming, we just don't know when. So in order to be ready when he comes, it's inevitable that every single believer has to have a more than just faith. To get to heaven if I die, yes, faith is enough. They all were waiting. They were all in the same group, but only half of them made it. What does that tell us? That in the waiting, of waiting for the bridegroom to come, I need to make sure that I am in constant relationship to the one who can direct me so that when he comes, I'm ready. If I could see it in a weird way, you're pickled with the oil of the Holy Ghost that when he comes, you are ready to be a part of this ceremony. You ever crack and open a jar of pickles and pull them out? It's like, oh, yeah, they're ready. Why? Because they were in something that caused them to be prepared for that day when that cracking was open and it was pulled out and could be tasted by us. Same thing with God. We could be absolutely, uh, completely ready. Why? Because he's coming back and he, not everybody's going to be ready. 
Isn't it interesting that when we read in uh, chapter 24, all the things that he said to different servants, the servant was there. Let's go back up to verse 43 of Matthew 24. Who then is a faithful and wise servant in whom the master has put in charge? Oh, boy, I think to me, this is, what it, this is what it looks like. When I become a believer, God graces me with his grace to take care of some things as a believer on this earth. Just like, remember the money situation we shared last week? Where God has given me something, he's graced me, he's taken me out of the debt of my sin, now he's graced me with something, with gifts and abilities of leading of the Holy Spirit, the Word of God, he's graced me with that, now what am I doing with his grace? Because the Bible says, beware of those who take God's grace in vain. So that means I can take what God gives me, and I can use it for wherever I want, and I can go wherever I want, and I can do whatever I want, and all of a sudden, the bridegroom shows up. <gasps> Uh-oh. What's that for? I thought you were waiting. Aren't you a part of the bridegroom? Didn't God grace you with something? Yes. But God's grace, it gives me the ability not to do my own thing, but to do the very thing I was designed to do from the day I was conceived. God's grace empowers me to live an upright, self-controlled, godly life in this present age, so that when he comes, I'm ready for him. So the reality is, is that what they did with God's grace, but I want you to look at the rest of the servant that didn't do anything with what he said. Verse 47 of Matthew 24, I tell you the truth, I will put him in charge of, the, of all his possessions. But suppose that servant, verse 48, is wicked. Remember, wicked comes from the word wicker, which means twisted. You ever seen wicker furniture? It's twisted. Wicked. And says to himself, my master is staying away a long time. And then he begins to beat his fellow servants and to eat and drink with drunkards, doing things he normally shouldn't have been doing. And the master of that servant will come on the day when he does not expect him. And an hour he is not aware of. And he will cut him to pieces and assign him a place with the hypocrites where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. And can I ask you a question? Where is the only place there's weeping and gnashing of teeth in the scripture? In hell. But he was in charge. He was in charge. You know there's going to be pastors that go to hell. Why? Because they're in charge, but they're taking God's grace and they're twisting it to make it fit their own lifestyle rather than surrendering and saying, Lord, have your way. Well, let me tell you, you're going to be just as, you're going to have the answer just as much as I do. Although I will have more answering to do because I'm in the place I'm in. God tells us that. But the reality, I'm going to answer because if I take what God's given me and I twist it to only fit what I want, then I'm going to have to answer for that. And I don't want you to answer for something you didn't, you aren't aware of. So it's vitally important that each of us becomes a wise servant, not a foolish servant, a wise virgin, not a foolish virgin, and we take care of what God has given us. The, the, the reality is, is that it's very, very easy for each of us to come to a place where we can take God's grace in vain. <coughs> I've got a bunch more scriptures that I'm not going to be able to go to because I do have to go to nursing home, but I think we're almost done. But turn on our way to 2 Corinthians 11. <coughs> 2 Corinthians 11. I want to show you that scripture I just quoted to you so you know I'm not pulling your leg. How I many you know it's not a bad thing to verify what God says in His Word? Any pastor that doesn't do that or doesn't want to do that, uh, be careful. 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 1. I hope that you will put up with a little of my foolishness, Paul was writing to the Corinthian church. But you are already doing that. I am jealous for you with a godly jealousy. I promise you to one husband, to Christ. So that I might present you as a pure virgin to him. Pure virgin. Isn't it interesting 
that when we come to Christ and I say, Lord Jesus, come into my life, I now become a pure and righteous, acceptable virgin to God. Does it mean that my behavior is all okay? I didn't say that. I just became in position so that God would accept me. Now, out of this new relationship with Jesus, I'm going to begin to pull things out of my life that God doesn't need anymore because they will only hinder me from doing what God called me to do. I'm going to allow the Holy Spirit to continue to direct me. I'm going to allow God's word to say, Jeff, if you don't need, you don't need bitterness towards your neighbor anymore, pull that out. You don't need hatred towards this race, pull that out. You don't need uh, lust in your eye, pull that out. You don't need the pride of life, you pull that out. And that's what the Holy Spirit comes in you. So that I now have a good relationship with my future husband. <laughs> that I'm going to live eternally with. He says, I am jealous of you with a godly jealousy, and I promise you to one husband, to Christ, that I might present you a pure virgin to him. But I am afraid that just as Eve was deceived by the serpent's cunning, your minds may somehow be led astray from your sincere and pure devotion to Christ. Even Paul knew you could be led away from Christ. Isn't that interesting? He's seen it how many times in his walk in ministry? So if that's the warning he gave to the Corinthian church, we can take that same warning to our own lives. Be careful that the enemy does not lure you away from your sincere and pure devotion to Christ. So then as a bride, I've got to protect my heart. I've got to allow God to once again protect me. Verse 4. For if someone comes to you preaching a Jesus other than the Jesus we preach, or if you receive a different spirit from the one you received, or a different gospel from the one you accepted, you put up with it easily enough. But if I do not think I am at the least inferior to those super apostles, I may not be trained speaker, but I do have knowledge. We have made this perfectly clear to you in every way. In other words, there was a bunch of people that came into the to follow Paul's ministry that was leading them away from Christ. That same thing can happen in our everyday life. All you have to do is turn your TV on and you can have someone pop up. It sounds good, but I promise you, they might not be leading you to Christ. Someone can stand in this pulpit for some reason and start teaching you something that's not in the Word of God. That's why you bring your Bibles to church. You follow along and you touch it. Just like, why? Well, I love the fact that you did that. Why? Because it helps me. We help each other. We're not above each other. We're walking together. We're walking in this thing together. So, with that, I love the fact that we love God's Word here and that will never change. Right? 